Palantir, uh, let's get to uh, that topic. So I'm obviously amazed with Palantir. I think it's a phenomenal, wonderful product. Uh, I realized the partnership that you guys had with him back in November 2021. Can you, I guess, just explain why uh, Palantir probably invested in you and why do you, why have you chosen to come out? Why or why are you choosing to integrate Foundry within WeGel? Well, you know, we were talking before about, about the potential of thousands of use cases, you know, such as parts failures. And uh, when my conversation starts with Palantir, one of the, one of the use cases they presented was uh, Airbus. Uh, and, you know, and, and Airbus is, you know, there, there's 6,000 um, providers of parts to, to Airbus in terms of manufacturing a plane. Right. So the idea of, you know, could Airbus provide critical feedback to parts providers of, of how the planes are performing? And, you know, and then we, when I, we, and, uh, I was talking to Cheyenne at, um, at Palantir, who's the chief operations officer. So, well, we should be doing, we should be thinking, thinking about the same problem in automotive. You know, there are hundreds of what they call tier one, tier two, tier threes in the supply chain. They would all like to have feedback of how their parts performing in vehicle. In fact, one of WeJo's other investors is Heller. Heller are a 6 billion euro parts manufacturer. They, you know, they manufacture laser lights. They manufacture um, you know, ABS gear, they manufacture EV powertrains, all sorts, really. So Heller was showing us a demand about how, how they'd like to understand better at how their parts perform outside an R&D environment. So we had the use case where we could show a tier one vendor wanted to understand that. And we had OEM saying, you know, actually, we'd like to be able to have a better way of, of providing information back to our supply chain about how, how parts are performing, good and bad. And, you know, I mentioned to you before about the, about the example of an airbag failing, failing at, at high speed. Right. So that sort of was the that was sort of that that was the, 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 the where, how our sort of relationship starts with Palantir was was what could Foundry do for us um, that 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 would in effect supercharge our business or super scale our business. So Foundry is as a distribution platform of of, of data insights. Uh, you know, with Palantir can go so much quicker than WeJo in terms of the the distribution they've already built in terms of ERP platforms. And in terms of the scale of Foundry, so it became a perfect partnership where the core discipline of processing real-time data it re remains as WeJo, that, right. that is our core IP. But then we're now working with, with the likes of Palantir's Foundry platform to, to supercharge our distribution. The first use case is actually in the EV space where we've announced something called the EV infrastructure operating system. And, you know, and what we're learning there is that there's this real sort of, um, there's this quandary around, you know, there's this, view that EVs have a range anxiety. And I said, well, actually, it's not true. We know the data from EVs. A typical EV drives 40 miles a day. It doesn't need a, it doesn't need a battery capacity of 300 miles when it's typically used at 40 miles. The problem is, is that everyone is worried about leaving their car or their vehicle plugged in overnight. And the, the grid, the utilities companies are worried about that as well. And they're, they're dreading the day when everyone gets home at 5 p.m., 6 p.m., plugs their vehicle and goes up and then it puts a huge drain on the grid. Right. What if there's intelligence in terms of distribution of data, which is what WeJo can do with Foundry, then we can we can tell the energy company, or the energy company can tell us about when their grid has available capacity. We can then form the vehicle in real time when it should or shouldn't be charging itself. So the consumer doesn't have to worry about any of that. They just plug their car in, plug their vehicle in, go back, go go in, go into their house, and then for all for all they know, their vehicle then charges up between two p two a.m. and three a.m. To, right. to give it that top up to be able to do to, to be able to do the distance of a journey that vehicle is going to need to do the following day. So, so what Foundry's done is supercharged distribution and brought us into new new sectors as well, such as such as the uh, utility sector. The EV charging infrastructure thing is so fascinating to me because I saw this article in January and I was like, "What are these guys doing? This is such an obvious issue." It's like, of course, if you plug in a bunch of cars at five p.m., it's going to be a huge strain on the grid. So, if we're talking about the EV revolution, well, if you're just using more, you know, greenhouse gas emissions to charge these things, it's like it's it's a wash. It doesn't really matter. So, it's like if you could build a software that could intelligently tell the grid when to charge cars. I mean, like yeah. it, it's a no brainer. And then you're, you're, you're communicating with municipalities, you're communicating with other electric vehicle gas stations that exist or gas, like electric vehicle charging stations that exist throughout the world. And like, you guys could quite literally become the operating system for how electric vehicles get charged. That would be the yeah. mission, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. You, you've, uh, you've said it, you've said it better than me. So, uh, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and you know, it's, it's really, you know, it's really funny. Uh, and just, just as a, just as a side, uh, I was, um, I was at uh, my, my five-year-old boy's school and I was talking to someone and he's and he's uh, he's, he's got a doctorate in energy uh, and he was telling me about about the issues that the energy, the grid has in, in Europe. And we sort of, you know, we bounced around these ideas around you know, the, the, the benefits to society of, 
you know, the, the, the answer is not for the grid to massively over-invest in infrastructure. Right. Uh, you know, the, 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 the answer is to have more intelligence about when infrastructure needs to be able to deliver on, you know, on, on an on-demand basis. So a great example of, of doing something good for society, and we, ha- we have this mantra of what we call data for good, and we think we always think with that lens. You know, we won't sell data to bad actors. We won't sell data without consent. This is a great example of this is that, you know, is, is that the, the governments globally are, are now incentivizing consumers to move to EV. The infrastructure has got to be able to keep up with that. And the answer isn't just throwing huge amounts of money at, 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 at infrastructure upgrades because they'll get it wrong. You know, there needs to be much more intelligence as well. You know, the Biden Infrastructure Act, so there's $5 billion of budget to improve the infrastructure. That could get spent very quickly in the wrong areas. So this is about having a more intelligent approach to when does uh, when 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 does a um, a vehicle needs to be charged?